Hello, welcome to Fibro Warrior, my new normal. I'm MJ Aragon, and I'm here with my producers, Jojo Merricks. Hello. And Tony Jeffries. Hi. Today, I will be sharing the spoon theory. Now, I've brought this up on occasion, and I'm so sorry it's taking me so long to get to it. I've meant to, and then I forget. If something goes in, my, in one ear and out the other, or in my head and right out back out again. So um, I'm gonna read that today, and uh, I wanna also talk about the, important, the importance of uh, listening to, uh, watching and reading uh, positive things that keep us, uh, our moods enhanced because, or elevated, because you know it's easy dealing with this illness day in and day out and all the things that come with it. Uh, it's, it's easy to get down, and uh, I'm gonna be honest with you today, I woke up feeling pretty crappy. Um, I felt pretty bad. I was feeling a little, I get that feeling like I don't belong here, you know? And uh, I, I was really, uh, just really down, really melancholy when I woke up. Um, and, you know, I talked with my, my love and talked about some things. And then I, of course, like I like to do, I wrote some things down and it always helps. I can't stress how much that helps. And so I wrote some things down about how I was feeling. And, uh, and got some of that off my chest, so that helped him. I had a doctor's appointment today, he ran some errands, so I was a little flustered earlier, but now that I've had time to relax, I'm feeling a little bit better. But, uh, but yeah, today didn't start off so hot, and so I, I wanted to, uh, you know, to say what, you know, things that, like listening to something that's uplifting, upbeat, you know, that really helps me a lot. Of course, we were driving the car and I was listening to upbeat music. Um, you know, watching a funny show or a comedy or something that just has a good happy ending, you know, having a happy ending, you know, even though it's not always realistic, it's nice to see that. It's nice to just imagine being in that happy ending. Um, and of course, reading something, you know, it's something that you love. And of course, I've talked to us before. I love Jane, Jane uh, Austen. And, uh, you know, so I like reading her stories and kind of bringing myself way back into that time, you know, and when things were so different from now, you know, so you kind of transport yourself into another world almost. So uh, I, I think that those things are important for us to do. And, um, and then I'm gonna read uh, actually my, my blog, Imagination is Our Escape, since it was pertinent to what I wanted to talk about today. So I'm going to begin with the spoon theory. Now you recall me talking about this a few times, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I didn't know it verbatim and I probably was misquoting it so badly, but- 12 uh, spoons, right? Yeah, yeah, it actually was 12. I was right about that. I right. I'm like, oh, it was 12 spoons. So I was right about that part. So I, at least I didn't screw it up completely. But uh, it's uh, The Spoon Theory by Christine Miserandino. Miserandino? I don't know if I'm saying that right. I apologize if I am. Uh, and uh, you can find it. I will put the link to where you can find The Spoon Theory if you want to read it yourself or anything. Or if you want to check it out, I think she has some things to offer as well. Uh, posters or something, if I recall correctly. Um, anyway, so it goes like this. Uh, my best friend and I were in the diner talking, and as usual, it was very late, and we're eating french fries with gravy. Gravy. Ugh. <laughs> like normal girls our age, we spent a lot of time in the diner while in college, and most of the time we spent talking about boys, music, or trivial things that seemed very important at the time. We never got serious about anything in particular and spent most of our time laughing. As I went to take some of my, medic my medicine with a snack, as I, usually, as I usually did, she watched me with an awkward kind of stare instead of continuing the conversation. She then asked me out of the blue what it felt like to have lupus and be sick. I was shocked, not only because she asked the random question, but also because I assumed she knew all there was to know about lupus. She came to doctors with me. She saw me walk with a cane and throw up in the bathroom. She had seen me cry in pain, and what else was there to know? Excuse me. I started to ramble on about pills and aches and pains, but she kept pursuing and didn't seem satisfied with my answers. I was a little surprised as being my roommate in college for, and friend for years, I thought she already knew the medical definitions of lupus. Then she looked at me with a face every sick person knows well, the face of pure curiosity about something no one healthy can truly understand. She asked what it felt like, not physically, but what it felt like to be me, to be sick. As I tried to gain my composure, I glanced around the table for help or guidance, or at least a stall for time to think. I was trying to find the right words. How do I answer a question I never was able to answer for myself? How do I explain every detail of every day being affected and give the emotions a sick person goes through with clarity? I could have given up, cracked a joke like I usually do, and changed the subject, but I remember thinking if I don't try to explain this, how could I ever expect her to understand? If I can't explain this to my best friend, how can I explain 
my world to anyone else. I had to at least try. At that moment, the spoon theory was born. I quickly grabbed every spoon on the table. Hell, I grabbed spoons off the other tables. I looked at her in the, in the eyes and said, here you go, you have lupus. She looked at me slightly confused, as anyone would when they are being handed a bouquet of spoons. The cold metal spoons clanked in my hands as I grouped them together and shoved them into her hands. I explained that the difference in being sick and being healthy is having to make choices or consciously think about the things when the rest of the world doesn't have to. The healthy have the luxury of life without choices, a gift most people take for granted. Most people start the day with a limited amount of possibilities and energy to do whatever they desire, especially young people. For the most part, they do not need to worry about the effects of their actions. So for my explanation, I use spoons to convey this point. I wanted something for her to actually hold, for me, then, for me to then take away, since most people who get sick feel a loss of a life they want, excuse me, a loss of a life they once knew. If I was in control of taking away the spoons, then she would know what it feels like to have someone or something else, in this case, lupus, being in control. She grabbed the spoons with excitement. She didn't understand what I was doing, but she was always up for a good time, so I guess she thought it, I was cracking a joke of some kind like I usually do when talking about touchy subjects. Little did she know how serious I would become. I asked her to count her spoons. She asked why, and I explained that when you're healthy, you expect to have a never-ending supply of spoons. But when you have to now plan your day, you need to know exactly how many spoons, in parentheses, uh, you are sharing with, you are starting with, I'm sorry. It doesn't guarantee that you might not lose some along the way, but at least it helps you, it helps to know where you are, where you are starting. She counted out 12 spoons. She laughed and said she wanted more. I said, nope. And I knew right away that this little game would work when she looked disappointed. And we hadn't even started yet. I wanted more spoons for years and haven't found a way to get more. Why should she? I also told her to always be consci conscious of how many she had and not to drop them because she can never forget she has lupus. I asked her to list off the tasks of her day, including the most simple. As she rattled off daily chores or just fun things to do, I explained how each one would cost her a spoon. When she jumped right into getting ready for work as her first task of the morning, I cut her off and took away a spoon. I practically jumped down her throat. I said, no, you don't just get up. You have to crack open your eyes and then realize that you're late. You didn't sleep well the night before. You have to crawl out of bed and then you have to make yourself something to eat before you can do anything else because if you don't, you can't take your medication. And if you don't take your medication, you might as well give up all your spoons for today and tomorrow too. I quickly took away a spoon and she realized she hasn't even gotten dressed yet. Showering cost her a spoon, just for washing her hair and shaving her legs. Reaching high and low that early in the morning could actually cost more than one spoon, but I figured it would get, I would give her a break. I didn't want to scare her right away. Getting dressed was worth, was worth another spoon. I stopped her and broke down every task to show her how every little detail needs to be thought out. You cannot simply just throw clothes on when you're sick. I explained that I have to see what clothes I can physically put on. If my hands hurt that day, buttons are out of the question. If I have bruises that day, I need to wear long sleeves. And if I have a fever, I need a sweater to stay warm and so on. If my hair is falling out, I need to spend more time to look presentable. And then you need to factor in another five minutes for feeling badly that it took you two hours to do all this. I think she was starting to understand when she theory where when she theor theoretically didn't get even um, didn't even get to work and she was left with six spoons then <clears throat> I explained to her that she needed to choose the rest of her day wisely since when your spoons are gone they're gone sometimes you can borrow against tomorrow's spoons but you just think how hard tomorrow will be with less spoons I also need to explain that, a, explain that a person who is sick always lives with a looming thought that tomorrow may be the day that a cold comes, or an infection, or any number of things that could be very dangerous. So you do not want to run low on spoons because you never know when you truly will need them. I didn't want to depress her, but I needed to be realistic, and unfortunately being prepared for the worst is part of a real day for me. We went through the rest of the day, and she slowly learned that skipping lunch would cost her a spoon, as well as standing on a train or even typing at her computer too long. She was forced to make choices and think about things differently. Hypothetically, she had to choose not to run errands so that she could eat dinner that night. When we got to the end of her pretend day, she said she was hungry. I summarized that she had to eat dinner, but she only had one spoon left. If she cooked, she wouldn't have enough energy to clean the pots. 
If she went out for dinner, she might be too tired to drive home safely. Then I also explained that it didn't even bother that I didn't even bother to add into this game that she was so nauseous that cooking was probably out of the question anyway. So she decided to make soup. It was easy. I then said, it is only 7 p.m. You have the rest of the night, but maybe end up with one spoon. So you can do something fun or clean your apartment or do chores, but you can't do it all. I rarely see her emotional. So when I saw her upset, I knew maybe I was getting through to her. I didn't want my friend to be upset, but at the same time, I was happy to think finally maybe someone understood me a little bit. She had tears in her eyes and asking quietly, Christine, how do you do it? Do you really do this every day? I explained that some days are worse than others. Some days I have more spoons than most, but I can never make it go away and I can't forget about it. I always have to think about it. I handed her a spoon I had been holding in reserve. I, sim I said simply, I have learned to live life with an extra spoon in my pocket in reserve. You need to always be prepared. It's hard. The hardest thing I ever had to learn is how to slow down and not do everything. I fight this, I fight this day to day. I hate feeling left out, having to choose to stay home or not. To get things done that I want to do, I wanted her to feel that frustration. I wanted her to understand that everything everyone does comes so easy, but for me, it is 100 little jobs in one. I need to think about the weather, my temperature that day, the whole day's plan before I can attack any one given thing. When the other people can simply do things, I have to attack it and make a plan like I am strategizing a war. It is in that lifestyle the difference between being sick and healthy. It is a beautiful ability to not think and just do. I miss that freedom. I miss never having to count spoons. After we were emotional and talked about this for a little while longer, I sensed she was sad. Maybe she finally understood. Maybe she realized that she could never truly and honestly say she understands. But at least now she might not complain so much when I can't go out for dinner some nights or when I never seem to make it to her house and she always has to drive to mine. I gave her a hug when she walked out of the diner. I had the one spoon in my hand and I said, don't worry, I see this as a blessing. I have been forced to think about everything I do. Do you know how many spoons people waste every day? I don't have room for wasted time or wasted spoons and I choose to spend this time with you. Ever since this night, I have used the spoon theory to explain my life to many people. In fact, my family and friends refer to spoons all the time. It has been a code word for what I can do and cannot do. Once people understand the spoon theory, they seem to understand me better, but I also think they live their life a little differently too. I think it isn't just good for understanding lupus, but anyone dealing with any disability or illness. Hopefully they don't take so much for granted or their life in general. I give a piece of myself in every sense of the word when I do anything. It has become an inside joke. I have become famous for saying to people jokingly that they should feel special when I spend time with them because they have one of my spoons. So um, she has it. Uh, it's available in English, Spanish, French, French and Hebrew translations. And uh, I, like I said, I will post the website so that you can check it out yourself. And she had some other things available as well. Hebrew and, translations? Yeah. And her name again was Christine Miseradino. Okay, she she must be. I wonder what her nationality is. Um, I'm not sure. It could be that she's Jewish. Yeah, yeah. it sounds like it. Yeah, it's very possible. So, um, you know, I because I deal with uh, I get melancholy a lot. I have to um. I have to find ways all the time to keep myself positive. So I watch. I watch way more TV than I probably ever in my entire life put together lately, and um, in the last five years, and uh, I found that you know when I'm doing good, I can watch the the serious shows and the you know the things that kind of bring you down because I'm in the right mindset. But if I'm not in that mindset and and I'm feeling down, I have to make an extra effort to watch things that are positive, and. Uh, you know, kind of like the spoon theory, you kind of have to think about things. So you have to think about what you're going to watch. It's kind of like it's the same thing you have to think about. You have to plan it in ahead. Uh, you can't just say, oh, I'm just going to watch this and, and I hope that you get through it if you're not having a good day and it's something that's very emotional. So, you know, I, I have a lot of things that I record in advance and then depending on how I'm feeling that day, I scroll through on, on the DVR and, and figure out what I want to watch. Um, if, like I said, if I'm having a decent day and I'm feeling good, I can watch anything. It doesn't matter. But if I'm, if I'm feeling low, you know, I look for the happy, sometimes, you know, borderline goofy things that are just ch even kids' movies on occasion because it's light. It's something light and I can kind of jump in and just enjoy it and have a 
couple you know laughs and giggle a little bit because it's not something that's serious and and it kind of lifts me up and I forget about whatever it was that was making me down and then of course uh, music music really really is, is awesome I love listening to I don't listen to as much as I used to I need to listen to more but I think a lot of that is because just knowing that I have roommates and I, I guess I could put in my ear phones which I do a lot lately but I don't know I just don't go to music as much as I used to and I know that when I was listening to music more I was happier so I do need to make a point to listen to music more and then of course writing things down or reading uh, positive books like Jane Austen for example and uh, you know so staying positive is is something that you actually have to make an effort I know that it's hard and a lot of us uh, struggle with that with all the things that come with being sick, but just your day-to-day -day things, having children or having people who still work or having a spouse, and there's other things that you have to take in consideration uh, along with how we feel. And, and unfortunately, this illness just takes over your whole life. And sometimes we forget that it's doing that and we let it take over our lives instead of it just being something that we have and still trying to be normal, as normal as we can, which is why I call this my new normal, because I still do things. I can't do all the things I wanted to, but I still do things and I still try to feel normal. So when I have a good day, I don't, I try not to overdo it, but I go out and do things because I'm having a good day. We have to remember to do that. We can't just uh, huddle in a ball in our room and, and forget about the world because that's not healthy for us. And uh, so um, here's my blog, um, Imagination is Our Escape. And uh, I wrote this a few weeks ago. This is number 11. Um, Over the years, I have watched a myriad of movies and read a number of books. And on occasion, I will choose one according to how I'm feeling. Melancholy is often the case, but sometimes it's happy, mad, or ultimately I'm just bored. Usually it's just simply something that's caught my attention, so I engage. As my improv instructor, Michael Chain, always says to us, read a book, watch a movie, with some expletives in between, ha ha. Yes, Mike, I will do it all more, promise. I've watched Red so many, they have all just seemed to meld together at this point. I'm drawn to dark psychological thrillers, film noirs, things of that nature, with some Stephen King and the like sprinkled in between. Not sure why really, they just call out to me. I, always read auto, I also read autobiographical bi <laughs> biographical, sorry, uh, novels once in a great while. But, that, but what I enjoy most are the period novels by Jane Austen, for example, one of my favorites. They seem to pull me back into the past, to a time I'll never know, but have found so indulgent over the years. I've even caught myself speaking in the dialect, if I've read two or more back to back, and chuckle at myself a bit as I hear those words escape my lips for the first time. It's interesting how impressionable we can be, isn't it? What is it about the unknown that's so intriguing? Is it the fantasy of it all, just to be out of our reality, if only briefly? Our lives are filled with all things fiber-related, and as warriors, life can become so, so mundane and even repetitive. So it's no wonder we crave an escape on occasion, and a good book or movie can do just that, especially when you're stuck in the house more often than not. I do get out, mind you, but, my disappoint but I'm disappointed all too often by what I can no longer do. I used to be so incredibly active, pushing myself to the limits and beyond. The happy, strong, funny MJ is still in there, underneath the cognitive fog, pain, and slargy, but she's still having a go at it, trying to break free again. I desperately miss who I once was able to be. Yes, I do obscure the pain still, just not with the lust for life I once had. I feel that I disappoint others as well as myself often these days. The guilt of that weighs heavy on my mind and my soul. So to get away from my self-inflicted guilt, I escape to another world through my books, movies, and even my dreams I'm so often able to recall. If I could read almost every day, I truly would, but my attention span doesn't allow for that. So watching a good movie fills in those gaps, although I still find myself hitting the rewind button all too often. Now there is a time, <clears throat> now there is a time when music was my first go-to and I'd sing. I'd sing until my voice went hoarse. I love to sing, but now I don't always feel, feel I can, which makes me relate so reverently to a bird in a cage at times who's lost its voice from being locked up for far too long. My one sweet voice is likely to crack because I rarely use it these days. Fearing it will sound less than melodic as it once was, I don't allow myself the joy as of late. But knowing the need to express myself through song may very well take a hold of me again. I shall work my way slowly back to it, very slowly. The featured song on our podcast, Love Hurts, is mine actually. I had written and recorded it in the mid 90s, but never finishing the song, unfortunately. 
a later tale I'll share. And so this is a once and done recording. I'm happy that what I did record gets some use though and is no longer just sitting in a drawer collecting dust. It's called Love Hurts. With these muses, my days are past. While I'm not ultimately working on all things Fiber Warrior, my new normal, lately, I may not seem like, it may not seem like much, I know, but I still find joy in life and it's the little things that make me happy. Your kindness, for instance, things you have said and written to me have all absolutely made my day, by the way, so thank you for that, truly. I have never been one who has set out to seek fame or fortune. I'm good with being a private person. The quiet and solitude can be most comforting. I don't need the expensive things, especially <clears throat> when I'm unable to acquire them myself. Oh, how I love that value, how I loved and valued my independence. Now just some of the home comforts are all I need. Love, having love in my life is what's kept me content. I've had the world handed to me in the past, but turned it down. You're wondering why, I suppose. I want, need to be loved the way I love. And if that isn't what's on the table, I'll pass. It doesn't mean a thing to me how nice the house, car, and clothes are, because if they knew me at all, it would be obvious I could care less about that. I've always valued companionship filled with love, respect, loyalty, and passion or compassion these days. Material things are temporary, frivolous, and empty. There are more priceless things in life. My family and friends are very important to me, although I've never been the most reliable, not intentionally, of course. Having fiber since my young teen years kind of rules your world, and you have to bend to its mercy. It hurts my heart when, if, I cannot help or be present, so I do the best I can through writing. It's my way of reaching out to you and letting you know that you are all important to me. I may not ever write a novel like, Afro, like the aforementioned Jane Austen. However, I am able to sit down and express the hopes and dreams that I think many of us are feeling, but are too scared and or unable to express. I will be your advocate, your strength, your voice. Just reach out to me and I'll help you in whatever way I'm able. Being able to write to you, for you, is an absolute honor that I will continually cherish. Your trust in me does not go unnoticed. So escape into the other world. A little indulgence is important to keep our minds free of life's clutter. Sweep away those cobwebs and revel in imagination. So that was imagination is our escape. And I'm really hoping I haven't read this before. Because as I'm reading, I'm like, did I read this one already? I don't think so, you've read that before. No? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Because I've read it a few times to myself and I'm like, Reading, going back and reading them because I always I always like correct a word or two even though I put it on there a while back I'll go through and I'm like oh let me change that mm -hmm. so I wasn't sure if it's because I've read, read it over or if it's because I've shared it before so probably but, uh, it's but, like yeah. it's like making music you hear things or oh, people don't know how many times you've gone to this like you get sick of hearing like I get sick of hearing my songs like oh because you've listened to them so many so times, many times yeah. yeah so no, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you haven't read that one good good because as I was reading that in my mind I'm like Hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I read this already. Yeah, but, but imagination I, is super yes. important, man. Yeah. That's how that's how anything that comes to exist comes to exist because somebody had to imagine it first. Yep, and you know? and for those of uh, those people that don't have you know a vast imagination, you know, they're maybe more uh, book you know book smarter. I, I don't know mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. They they just don't have the creative side, I guess mm -hmm. you'd say. Um, although everybody has that in, in some fashion, but I mean, as far as music and writing and things like that, you know, it's nice to f come along and find someone who can express that in a way that touches you and can just take you somewhere else and can transport you. Like I said, like some of those books, I feel like I'm back in time when I'm reading them. I can right. picture myself being there mm -hmm. and all the things happening. And even when I watch the movies, the, re the movies that are made of the book, you know. Mm -hmm. They're um, not as good. They're not as they're good. They're never as good. But I can see that my my imagination kind of fits with some of the things of course, that they were thinking of course that, they, they cut it and chop it up in such a way that it doesn't flow the same right but like things that i pictured i'm like oh that's kind of how i pictured it you mm -hmm. know they're showing a big ballroom you know or, or things like that or how people are dressed or what the particular uh character looks like sometimes it's not exactly as i expect but other times I'm like oh it's kind of right on and right. i guess it's like any movie i like um i know I kind of set myself up for disappointment a little bit by reading the book first. Mm -hmm. But I like to read the book first and then watch the movie so I can see how my imagination uh, matches with the, the director or, who, or the, whoever yeah, made the movie, the you know, and, and see how, how similar what I was imagining is to what they picture when they read it. Or, right. You know. So uh, so I do it for that reason. I know most people are probably like, you should watch the movie and then read the book because then the book is so much better and you won't be disappointed. I like... 
I haven't done it a lot. Like, all I usually read is autobiographies about, like, music people. Yeah. That's all I like. I don't yeah. read a lot of things at all. But if I have read a story and then the movie comes out, I always, I want to see how close they got to the actual story. Mm-hmm. Like, I I want to see if they swayed too far. And right. That's always exciting because it's like you said, you imagine it when you're reading it. Then you see this character or whatever. Yeah. There's something that's happening. It's like, oh, I've been, this is sick how they did this. They did yeah. a really good job or it sucks. I was going to say those people that aren't creative are really good at math. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Yeah, but I've seen people who can do both. Like, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of left and right. I, I have both. I'm, I'm I'm ambidextrous as well. I don't know if that has anything oh, to do with it. Oh, are you really? You're, yeah. you're ambidextrous? Yeah. That's you know, pretty cool. I mean, I haven't worked. I could probably do everything. Can you right paint with both hands? Actually, yeah. I paint with both hands. That's crazy. Yeah. That's I when I realized I could because I'm really good with my left hand as my right. And, right. Because I didn't really pay attention to how many things I did with my left hand. And then after that, I started realizing I do. In fact, you know, when people say, you know, cross your arms, I, I don't have, I don't, have a you go-to. can't have a relaxing yeah, everybody, position everybody has, across every, your arm. Well, oh yeah, the right, the right. Is it the dominant hand is I over top? I don't have a go-to. I, I do. Is I it do at, both. is it comfortable both ways? Yeah, that's why I said. Because that's really weird. I never thought about this. Yeah, is very uncomfortable. Like, it's it's the same. It feels the same to I'm, me. I'm left. I'm yeah. right-handed, so that's super yeah. uncomfortable to yeah. me. That's why. That's my point. It doesn't either. Either way, it feels comfortable crossing either leg. I don't have a choice. Right. You know, I don't have a particular thing that I like to do and. And uh, so yeah, I want to see you write with both hands. I don't know if I've ever met an ambidextrous person. Um, I think I, I think it was one kid in elementary school, but I don't think I got I, it. I don't write with. Well, there's certain things that are more difficult to use your left hand, and so mm-hmm. because most things are made for dominant right-handed people, mm-hmm. so I tend to. But any anything else that I shave with both hands, I yeah, I do. I use my left hand as much as possible. The only thing I don't use my left hand for is is writing. That's the only thing. I can screwing dribble. things in or unscrewing them. I or doing anything. I can I dribble use. really good with my left hand, but I'm yeah. right-handed. But I can't shoot with my left. But I can shoot with my right. Like, yeah. but I that's it. I got. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's I mean, there's nothing pe- else I do good with my. I left mean, hand. some people are ambidextrous because of they've learned to play the guitar or things like that. But mm-hmm. then some people are just naturally that way, which is just I just happen to be, right. and it's just worked out for me. we have been helpful throughout life to be able to do. Okay, so let's say I broke my right hand, I wouldn't totally be shit out of luck. I because would. I'm used to using be, both hands. It, so. It'd be bad for me. I'd have an afro because <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be able to shave my head. Like it'd be all bad, man. It'd be. <laughs> You'd have an afro. That would suck. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you said you watch thrillers, huh? Yes. Have yes. you have you seen Nightcrawler? Um, you mean the old, the original? I watched. The I haven't. Old one. I haven't seen the original. There's an old Just one. Yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal yeah. one. Oh yeah. No, the, I that's the new one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he's I've the photographer. It. No, and I haven't. Weird. Oh, I haven't so seen it's it. so good. I haven't seen. It. In fact, I was gonna bring up something. Um, I know we're going a little over time. Um, uh, Hearts in Atlantis. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. Um, one of my favorite actors. Um, he was in Silence of the Lambs, and I can't think of his name right now. He was the bad guy. He was Buffalo Bill? No, no, no. The other guy, the one that helped them. Uh, oh, anyway. Hannibal. Yeah, um, the one freaking, him. what's that dude's name? I can't think of his name. Anyway, I love him. He, he is in. What? He's, he's in. What? Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins. I just kept hearing. He's so low, bro. I, I sound like you're saying cop, Coppins or something. No, I want to know the <laughs> name or else I'm not, I'm not going to be able to think about anything um, else. Okay, uh, so. Yeah, Anthony Hopkins. So he was in it and um, it was a good movie. The movie was good. Um, it's a it's a Stephen King book. Hearts when did Atlantis. it come out? Is and it I older? Love, I love Stephen King. It's older, yeah. And the movie's pretty good, but it's the book. There's so much more. The book has so much more to offer. That's it's so far out. The book is kind of far out, mm-hmm. and things that are happening was, they didn't touch on that at all. The more of the sci-fi kind of feel that the book has was left out of the movie. It was more just like you know. Yeah, and that's it, disappointing. It was, yeah, and so um, when I I'd read the book long, long time ago, but I couldn't recall the end, and so I'm thinking maybe I didn't finish the book because watching the movie I didn't notice that that was missing, or maybe because I've read so many things or watched so many things, they they do all kind of get mushed together. I don't know what's what. Mm-hmm. But uh, when I read the mo- the book again, I was like, oh my goodness, there's a bunch of stuff that was not even touched on in the movie, and even though the movie worked and the movie was good, mm-hmm. it was missing a big piece of what that that book was about. But I love I love Stephen King stuff as well, and I love sci-fi thrillers and just horror flicks and all I like that kind of stuff I don't know why I just really I really enjoy watching it um maybe my mom because my mom liked that stuff too I'm not really sure but I've just always loved it right but uh but yeah so you know doing you know involving yourself into you know reading the books and and listening to music and watching things that you love you know it, it gets us out of our head and so when we're having a bad day you know watch something positive listen to great music you know read a good book 
you know um even uh i discovered you know because i can't always uh hold the books mm -hmm. and i have uh, jane austen instead of having her individual books i just have a book of all of her stories it's a big book right and my hands are hurting that day so i'm like hmm, let me see if there's audiobook and there's audiobook on youtube so i listened to uh what was it i've read a couple now or listened to a couple now was it persuasion maybe not um anyway it was uh, one of her books that I, I listened to, and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool, because I was just doing other things while I was listening to the book. I'm like, hey, I get to do two things at once, whereas if I'm reading a book, I'm not doing anything but reading the book. Right. But that was pretty cool. So there's that as well. But anyway, so uh, having a bad day, easy to perk up. Just uh, get, a, get your mind on something else. It always helps, whatever, whatever it may be, even if it's a pet or something or your kids or just something that makes you happy, then just... Uh, do that get your mind out of it because say us staying in that in that in our room and in a ball and and just being sad is not it's not healthy so as always you are not alone i love y'all love y'all love y'all love y'all love y'all <laughs>scotland yeah it's beautiful I've, I've never been there but i've just the pictures and scenery All i've seen from movies hills. and whatnot yeah it's, it's gorgeous i would love to go mm -hmm. i have scottish and some heritage uh, really yeah some i've other. never seen i've never seen a black irish or scottish person i'm waiting to see my first black yeah. scottish Irish. yeah yeah that'd be yeah i remember like i never would see like british any well then, then that, would be, my, that would be my kids then oh yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. So. Well, well, with, 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 the, with the accent. Oh yeah, that's the go. thing. With I want I want to see him with yeah. the accent because you it, know it's always a joy. I wish I wish I could have read it the way she would because I love hearing that. You know what I mean? That, oh yeah, that the accent. accent. Yeah, yeah, I love hearing that. I think I, it's so awesome. Yeah, I love accents. Yeah. So yeah. you know, I would like. I remember when I saw like the first black person that was like British mm -hmm. and had an accent. I'm like, oh, that's crazy. Right. Like, <laughs> Because you don't expect it. You, you expect no. everyone to talk like we do here right, in the U.S. Exactly. And so when someone has an accent of any of any kind, yeah. it's interesting to listen to. I, right. I, I like listening to I, I would just listen to someone talk about nonsense if they have mm -hmm. an accent. I know that's silly, but it's true. Right. Um,